Good evening. Don't blame yourself if total confusion reigns in your mind about the Battle of the Countervail. I've never seen the forest industry so mad at the politicians in my life. And we're getting close to the final chapter on something which is going to cost somebody a lot of money. Because the Americans have already given us a preliminary ruling that they want a 15% tax on softwood lumber into their country. That's one of the things we're going to deal with tonight after the break. Coming up live and refreshed from her dazzling performance at last night's Grey Cup Chili Cook-Off. To dance is human, but to polka is divine. The pride of Consort Alberta, Katie Lang. The world's bankers have built a glittering financial center in Hong Kong. Is the same future possible for Vancouver? Tonight, two experts on international banking. Jill Bodkin, chairman of the BC Securities Commission and Michael Goldberg, commerce professor at the University of British Columbia. But first, when the premiers met in Vancouver, they left thinking they had a deal to stop countervailing duties in the U.S. on Canadian softwood lumber. But the industry leaders are crying foul. It's pretty clear that uh, we're now, we've been sucked in up to our noses on this one, and heaven knows how they're going to get us out of it. In the studio with Webster, Mike Apsey, president of the Council of Forest Industries. And your particular hyperbole was about collective dismay of the forest industry over, as Zimmerman said, you being sucked in. Now, I thought we had a deal. I heard Mulroney and Carney and everybody else saying we have a deal to settle the 15% 15 preliminary tariff on our lumber. What went wrong? We have no idea, Jack. For five years, this industry has led the battle right up until midweek last week when we were excluded from the whole process and we learned just as everybody else learned through the press that Canada had made a 15 percent a very costly offer to the Americans what went wrong I have no idea we we're as surprised as anybody now has that deal putting it to you elementarily now been consummated have the Americans agreed that if we up our logging and cutting costs 15 percent that they will lift the counter bill. They have not. Was There's that been the plan? No deal. Was that the plan? The plan was to offer the Americans a 15% export tax in Canada on our exports to the United States. The way they've done it means that the U.S. industry has to agree to it. The U.S. industry has not agreed to the to the plan. The deal was that this 15%, if accepted by the Coalition for Fair Lumber Imports, would result in the complainants lifting their countervail petition. Exactly. Now, so what do you think is going to happen? Because it's got to be settled within a few days, has it not? Well, the original proposal by the provincial governments was to enter into what they call a suspension agreement. That deadline is tomorrow. We are not going to have a suspension agreement. The Canadian government will not entertain one and entertain negotiating with the Americans. So what they've now tried is to have the petition withdrawn. That takes the permission of the U.S. industry. So far, they've withheld that permission. Now, the suspension agreement would have been a bad thing, would it not? The suspension agreement is a bad thing, and we consider this offer at 15% to be a bad thing. The suspension agreement, however, would have been pleading guilty to the 15% subsidization, and that could, would have hung over your heads in the industry forever, correct? Well, this, this offer of 15% through uh, this mechanism also in our minds uh, indicates uh, guilt. And that's why we're very extremely upset, because it's undermining our legal battle, which must continue. I'm trying to keep this symbol for my own benefit and everybody else's benefit. But if this 15% upping of our logging and lumbering costs in this country does not satisfy the people in the States, then what happens? In other words, if all the deadlines passed and there is no agreement, then what happens? What happens then is the Commerce Department keeps on with their, their timetable and they decide in the end of December what they're going to do. Whether they're either going to overrule their preliminary decision or they're going to announce some uh, final decision, either at 15%, somewhat lower, or even higher. And that will be something which will be payable by American, by Canadian exporters to the United States through their customs arrangements. Well, it would be paid into U.S. coffers. But what people don't realize is that even if we allow the case to go that far, Canada can still enter into an agreement with the Americans to have the money stay in Canada. 
Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You're telling me that even if they do do that, if they slap us with a 15%, you can still go to the Americans and negotiate so that the money can stay in Canada. Who would get the money that stayed in Canada? Well, depending on what offsetting uh, mechanism was put in place. Right now, we have the federal government proposing a 15% export tax refundable to the provinces. We go one step further and saying, if that has to happen, we don't think it has to happen, we go one step further and say that those funds should go into silviculture in the provinces. Not refundable to the companies? No. Because the companies are doing very well now, thank you very much, despite the strike, aren't they? They have to do very well, Jack, after the five years of terrible right. losses they've sustained. Let me put on my other cap. I've been very nice and polite and gentle with you. Is it not a fact that the people of British Columbia want to see that 500 million additional logging costs levied on the companies so that we, for a, at long last, we'll get a fair share of revenues and can do some decent silviculture in the province of BC? Mm. A, we want to see more civil culture as an industry. B, adding $550 million to our costs would put a value on timber which is not there. It would be absolutely erroneous to do so. The province of this, the people of this province have had a fair return from their resource over the decades. Well, that's not what Van der Zandt thinks, that's not what Kemp thinks, that's not what Monroe thinks, it's only the big companies that think that. You're doing very well in your exports and softwood lumbers. In fact, you've gone from 19% of the American market to 33%, right? With reason. But a, we're more competitive. With lack B, of caution, they, though. B, they want our product. And C, we have uh, an exchange rate in Canada's advantage. We are there for good reasons. We are not there because we're subsidized. That's the last reason we're there. You're there because you're good operators and because there's a good market there just now. But you were very unwise, were you not, in refusing to heed the, your victory in the countervail a couple of years ago and still continuing to up your share of the American market? No. Just like Japanese cars taking over the world. Not at all. Canadian lumber taking over not the at world. All. Not at all. The Americans can't supply what they need. So what do we and they come from? to us. Up the price and sell it to them. We have tried. Yeah. We have a competitive market. We're there for a reason. The reason is we're competitive. We have an industry that's far more productive than theirs. We've got an exchange rate in our favor. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, Americans, consumers are demanding our product. Just let's, let's summarize it if we can. It's now in the hands of Carney and Vanderdam, correct? And it's, Baroni. It's in the hands right now of the U.S. industry who have heard a proposal from Canada for a 15% export tax. It's up to them to decide whether or not they're going to accept that and withdraw their petition. And if they don't accept it, the Americans then will carry on with their usual routine. Exactly. And charge us something or other. Maybe nothing. If they look at the facts... Oh, you're dreaming again, Mr. Apsi. You know perfectly <laughs> well that the tides of protectionism in the United States demand that they're going to hammer you on this countervail. That's another part As of this uh, offer, which I find uh, somewhat ludicrous. You make an offer to the Americans. Let's assume for a minute they accept it. Nothing prevents them from launching another case within six months or a year mm -hmm. and harassing us again. Nothing is out there that says they won't uh, go next spring to their Congress and say, please mm -hmm. impose uh, further restrictions on Canadian lumber. <coughs> We're saying we should have fought this thing right through. In other words, you are blaming Van der Zandt and Kemp specifically for blowing the gaff in the negotiation. But they hadn't been in office five minutes when they said, ah, we're going up the stumpage, we've got up the stumpage, right? I'm not blaming any set of politicians. What I'm saying is that up to last week, we were united in this country, both levels of government and the industry, in fighting this case through. Because of the ramifications yeah. to this industry, to the pulp industry, to the newsprint industry, and any other resource industry in this country. The ramifications of this case are horrendous. We'll be harassed by countervailing duty cases for years. On all kinds of On things. all kinds of natural. We're, having, we're seeing here oh. a, a foreign government impose natural resource pricing policies on our, on our provincial governments. I say that that's wrong, and we should fight it. Well, I agree with you on a suspension, but the idea of this buyout was to avoid that, wasn't it? Nothing Give them is... 15% and say go away. Yeah, but 15% uh, doesn't guarantee that they're going to go away. But nothing guarantees they're going to go away. <laughs> That's right. So why pay it?
fight it all away. But then uh, you are protecting your own ox. You don't want an additional 500 million in stumpage or 400 million in this province, do you? We can't afford it. The industry cannot afford it. Mike Apsey, your calls, if you understand, even a bit of it, after the break. I hate to ask any more questions, but there was a double track scheme whereby all of you, politicians, industry, provincial and federal, were all agreed to fight the countervail legally to the very end, right? Exactly. But then there was the other little track in which it said, let's go around the back door and see if we can make a deal. You didn't go along with that at all. We joined with the governments months ago to make an offer prior, uh, prior to the preliminary uh, decision. Our option was an export tax at that time, and we were told by both levels of government was not possible. Now we see an offer of about three times mm -hmm. what would have been offered at that time with an option that is all of a sudden magically now possible. Yeah, they went up from 8 to 10 percent to 15 percent. Oh, yeah. Let's try this question. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Apsey, isn't the fact that the companies are uh, competitive uh, due to the value of our dollar, and isn't this 15 percent tax by the Americans uh, their way of handling this? Well, it's their way of trying to offset uh, the competitive ability of our mills and a certain uh, percentage of that uh, exchange rate uh, advantage that we have. Exactly right. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Um, I'd like to say one thing, that in the midst of all this moaning and groaning about countervailing duties and the trade thing, you're speaking with a country that has a $20 <coughs> billion dollar trade surplus with the United States. And if it weren't for a great deal of forbearance on the part of the United States, uh, Canada would really be held up to ransom. I'd like to see what Mr. Yapsey has to say about that one. Well, there's no question that uh, we have an imbalance. I'm not sure that that's wrong. I understand that that's a visible balance. And if you look at the invisible uh, account as well, you'll find that it's uh, virtually a <coughs> saw-off between the two countries. I've heard that. Debt servicing, for instance. Exactly. Just saws it right off halfway. Can't see the numbers. Go ahead, please. Yes, I've heard that uh, the stoppage fees in B.C. are only a tenth of that they are in the States. Uh, what would be the reason for that? There's a, a very uh, large number of good reasons why uh, the values of the standing timber on both sides of the border are, or on the sides of the border are different. Uh, we have a different uh, species mix, a different quality mix. We have different uh, access problems. We have much more severe logging conditions. And once you take all of these factors into account, cut the tree and move it to the mill, our studies have shown that the log costs at the mill are the same on both sides of the border. And you presented that case at the Condeville. Exactly. Tell me this one question, though. When they come up to look at our stuff, do we give them everything they want to know about our industry, details of forest management licenses, details of everything? Jack, when we were asked a question of the Commerce Department, this country has uh, given them everything that they've asked for, truckloads of it, in fact. Just recently, they had a team of about a dozen people scurrying across this country verifying the information that we sent to them earlier. And they've gone away happy with the, with the results that they found. In other words, they verified that the information that we submitted was correct. Go ahead, please, from Victoria. I'd like to ask Mr. Apsey why it is that uh, in 1979, when the forest industry as a whole made an after-tax profit of $1 billion, why he claims that uh, the forest industry cannot afford to uh, spend more of its, its own money on uh, silviculture when their expenditures, I believe, in that year totaled 1% of their uh, after-tax profits. I think, if, I think what, if you look at the numbers that uh, this industry paid to the owner of the resource in those years, you'll find that we paid in excess of $600 million in stumpage alone. The question is not whether industry should be paying more uh, into, into silviculture, it, what should the owner of the resource, the province, be putting back into, into the resource. And we have maintained as an industry, they should be putting more of what they earn from us back into the resource. That argument will go on forever, but uh, nobody has any great faith in the stumpage system or the supervision of tree farm licenses in this province. Wouldn't you agree? No, I don't agree. Uh, tree farm licenses in this province are managed to a standard that uh, is, uh, is top in the world. 
there are some private lands in certain parts of the world that may be managed a bit better well, because I mean, they're private lands. I've been brainwashed into believing that Sweden does these things properly and that we, we really botch everything up. I've been to Sweden and that's not the case. Go ahead from, where is it? Armstrong. Hello, Jack. Yeah. I uh, just phoned and uh, I've been watching this forestry thing take place over the last year because I work in the forest industry. And I think the uh, best solution to it is to uh, agree with Americans on their 15% countervail. And uh, by the same token, put a 15% export tax on energy, electricity, and uh, natural gas. You mean try and recover it, but you wouldn't get by 500 million, 400 to 500 million dollars, would you? Uh, eh? I have no idea. I'm not sure on which, uh, uh, which source uh, you'd put it. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, uh, Jack? Yes. Well, am I on? Yes. Oh, um, as a Canadian, I have been very hurt to uh, see our politicians and our business people almost down on their hands and knees begging the Americans to buy our lumber. Um, it seems to me that we are in a very poor bargaining position by making ourselves so dependent upon the Americans for a market in our most vital industry. I'm wondering whether or not enough has been done or what more could be done about selling our lumber to other countries, which would put us into a much better bargaining position. Okay. The uh, council that I represent, its main function is offshore promotion of, of wood products. We spend a great deal of uh, money uh, in the industry and in the provincial government and the federal government in promoting offshore sales. We agree. We've got to find a better mix of sales around the world, but the bottom line is the American market is and will always be the biggest uh, market for our product. Go ahead, please. I think you're going to have to face the fact that uh, Mr. Van der Zam and Mulroney outsmarted the companies. That money was going to be paid one way or the other, and the companies are raving mad because now it's going to come directly from them instead of the Canadian people. And no, that's really so. the situation. And that 15%, <coughs> the uh, government might just take and help the silviculture, tree planting, and so on. You must admit that's what Van der Zam and uh, Carney appear to be headed for, is it not? Well, what they've done, Jack... Instead of you getting the money, we get the money. Well, they've got some credence. They've put some credence in a, in a badly flawed decision, and it's going to cost our industry a tremendous amount of money. This industry, though, has said that if there has to be a deal, if there's a countervail, that, this mo that the money generated must stay in this country and must be put into civil culture. And you told me earlier on in the program that even if the Americans impose the countervail, there is a mechanism by which we can keep that in this country. Sure, you make a negotiation for withdrawal of the petition after the final uh, decision is made at the end of December. So you're still going to fight it, but you can't fight it if the Canadian government doesn't fight it, can you? Yes, the process is in place. We are still fighting the, the case and now, until there's a deal, uh, we continue to fight. What do you think is going to happen? I have no idea. Don't you I think can't outguess what's going through the minds of the U.S. industry The today. next step, though, will be, though, if the 15% package is sufficient to make the, the Coalition for Fair Lumber Prices pull in their horns and lift the petition, it's over for the moment. It's over for the moment. And you don't think that's going to happen? I'm not sure whether that's going to happen or not. My thanks to Mike Apsey, President and CEO of the Council of Forest Industries. Next, we're going to have a look at another industrial story tonight with a couple of experts after the break. One of the great ploys of the new government in Victoria is that they want to make Vancouver an international financial centre and there was a conference about it yesterday. And guess what? Austin Taylor, one of the great high mucky mucks of McLeod Young Weir in Toronto, you know, he, he said there's only room for one financial centre in Canada. And that if there were one in Vancouver, it would only dismantle and dilute Toronto's position. How is that for snotty-nosed Eastern comment? No wonder why we don't like them. You know, we're all the hicks and the sticks. Here is Jill Bodkin, the chairman of the VC Securities Commission. And here is Mike Goldberg, who is studying international financial centers for the government of British Columbia. And you know him from my morning program. 
Professor of Faculty of Commerce, Doctor of Economics. Now, having been slapped down by Austin Taylor, are you now going to fold your tents and go away and tonight securing the knowledge there can be no financial centre for Vancouver? Absolutely not, Jack. Uh, I think it's very important that we understand that Vancouver is completely different than Toronto. In fact, we think there is ample room in this country for three financial centres. Toronto has its traditional big banking, big securities firm uh, focus. Vancouver is Pacific Rim, trade oriented. Uh, we're talking about bringing in and emphasizing uh, on the securities side the kind of venture capital uh, that is happening now, not only for British Columbia firms, but for non-Canadian firms being financed through the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Yesterday we saw the Hong Kong and Shanghai mm. Bank of Canada expand their presence in this city as a very real uh, demonstration of the kind of trade ties uh, that we have. Good, but mind you, I do realize that what the Hong Kong Bank did yesterday was save the Bank of BC from going down the tube. Well, and it's very important oh, that no. our local bank Had is, to be saved yeah. from going down the tube, you know, yeah. to all intents and purposes. Michael, surely there are only three major financial centers in the world, which in years ahead will control everything, London, New York, and Tokyo. But even there, they dominate. They're the primary centers in the world. But even there, they're very different. And there are a whole set of second-tier centers. Uh, there are several in, in Switzerland and Sydney and Australia is one, and Singapore and Hong Kong. There's plenty of room in the world of finance for very well-defined, tightly targeted financial service cities. And what we're saying is that we have certain advantages because of our time zone, because of our state-of-the-art communication, excellent access to the Orient, plus our cultural ties with the Orient, that we can do things that other people yeah, can't but do. I mean, what I don't understand from either one of you, please, is what would be different about any legislation you passed in BC to help us create more money and more wealth and more this and that on the West Coast? I mean, what is going to be created? Just a, a bank of computers or some special federal legislation to let us do something? Let's talk about what would actually exist here and, in fact, what does exist. You have people in the financial services industry working, negotiating their deals. You have lawyers, you have accountants, you have geologists. You indeed have computers, you have office space filled, you have business people coming and uh, taking up our hotel rooms. And that's all commerce and it's all an increase in terms of services that uh, we are gradually building. And uh, certainly there's legislation that can help at both the provincial and the federal level. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have the right kind of welcoming regulatory framework, and that's part of the, the job that I have. Uh, there may be tax advantages, and certainly that's the oh, kind of yeah. area that the federal and provincial government What kind of fiddles about. would you establish in, in Vancouver to enable these big money people to come and operate out of here? Well, Are you thinking of special entities? Does this include special no, enterprise I don't, I don't, zones? No, I don't think it need include any tax giveaways. I don't think it has to include... We've got to uh, something to attract these Well, I think we already do. I think we've got an ability to, to repackage what we have now. Take Jill's area of responsibility. The Vancouver Stock Exchange has the potential of being a capital market for high-risk new ventures in Asia because there are no stock exchanges in Asia that do that very well. The Tokyo Stock Exchange is not suited to small firms. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange is 80% dominated by real estate stocks. So people in Asia want to get access to capital markets. We have a really unique opportunity to provide that kind of access. And once we have the VSE expanding its role, the whole other set of financial services that go with that will come into play. We have an enormous opportunity for insurance and marine insurance because of the <coughs> port. Mm -hmm. We haven't exploited these. What about special enterprise zones? I never did understand what they were supposed to be. Well, I thought there would be kind of non-union enclaves where you could do it the hell you like. Well, I think that the common point in concept, Jack, is the fact that in an international financial center, traditionally you're looking at uh, non-resident companies being able to do business relatively free of some of the kinds of constraints that we, mm -hmm. we have imposed. In Canada, we are certainly opening um, up our financial services sector anyway, and uh, you're seeing uh, that banks are going into securities business, uh, and that's good. That's, that helps the companies who want to raise money. It helps investors who want to put their money into uh, mm -hmm. small business, and uh, 
We want to do more of that. How about proper supervision of all these things? So the Vancouver Stock Exchange does not have the most shining record of impeccable behavior in North America. In fact, one would be hesitant to put money into a penny stock in the morning if you didn't take it out five minutes later. Well, that's old no, history. No. Is, is what that old history? That, that's old. It really is. Oh, come now. Yeah, I mean, it may be old history, but in, in song and story. We have the best venture capital market in North America. For raising money for mining. For raising money for mining. Have you got and good, tough gone, regulations now? Well, that's part of what having a securities commission is all about. Uh, but also, Vancouver is shifting. We used to have 5% of what was happening in Vancouver mm -hmm. that was non-mining. We now have 30%. 40% of the business is non-Canadian on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Montreal's crying for international business. It's happened here, and uh, the, the markets, the people who are investing understand that uh, they can profit. They can get in on the hemlows uh -huh. and profit from gold mines in well, Ontario. Yeah, Hemlow was uh, one that was financed from Vancouver, was it mm -hmm. not? So my colleagues just did a study of the, the VSE, and they found that there are no returns to an insider that are not realized by an outsider. In other words, it is a level playing field. And you can't say that about that many stock exchanges. Even the vaunted New York Stock Exchange oh, no, has had some trouble you, recently. When you see what's been happening there. Right. But one other kind of local thing, I noticed that no federal ministers came to your conference yesterday down at the Pan Pacific. It was of great concern to us that it, they it, didn't. I and, know. Uh, I think it's damnable that they didn't. What we had here were the financial community from across the country. We had the American financial community. We had London. Uh, we've had, even without much promotion, approaches either through this conference or uh, just coming our way. The People's Republic of China came to see us about raising an equity issue uh, a couple of months ago, and the federal government didn't come. Well, I certainly wish you all the best. I'm grateful for you to drop in to publicize your, uh, your, your plans. Jill Bodkin, Chairman of BC Securities Commission. You were the former Deputy Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs. Right? That's right, Ken. And my old friend Mike Goldberg, Doctor of Economics from UBC. You will have your report ready until, fe will you have a report ready soon? Very. Hmm? Very soon. Very soon. My thanks. Next, I'm going to have a change of pace with, what's her name? What's <laughs> her name again? The girl in the cowboy boots. Katie Lang, <laughs> after the break. Feet up on the table. Okay. Put your feet up on the table. Right Do now. as you're told. Well, okay. <coughs> okay. Is that it? Oh, put your feet down again. You cut my table with your spurs. How I much made sure I didn't. How much did these uh, cowboy boots cost? These ones were fourteen dollars. Where did you get them? At uh, Value Village in Edmonton. Great stuff. Value Village. Yep. Open seven days a week. You betcha. All credit cards accepted. Uh. I don't know about that one. Uh, where did you buy your latest ball gown? <laughs> What's my latest ball gown? Oh, I mean, you were here in a wedding dress once. Yeah. You got that from the Salvation Army, mm, didn't you? Yeah. Well, let's see, where did I do my latest bit of shopping? I can't remember. Don't now, ask me questions like that, Jack. I will so too ask you okay. questions like that. If you want a question, KD Lang, because this is KD Lang, call her now. This is country and punk. She is a riot. She's my kind of singer. She's mixed with the high and the mighty. She's even a very good friend of Peter Gazowski. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. And you've just done, what were you doing in Britain? I was recording the album in London, England, with uh, producer Dave Edmonds. Mm -hmm. And it's finished. We've, it's been finished since August, and we're, we've been waiting patiently for the release, and the release date is February 16. <coughs> and you were on late night with David Letterman? Yes. But in fact, you almost wouldn't talk to me today when I phoned you. You said, I don't speak to people like you, regional people. I was on with Letterman. I, and I saw you on Hee Haw. You saw me on Hee Haw? Mm -hmm. You did? Am I lying again? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's run yet. She was on Hee Haw in Nashville October 17th. 
I re yeah, I recorded the show, ah. but it hasn't played yet. But you'll belong there, you know. Cause I that's know. Well, see, the best thing about me doing Hee Haw is that that's the first sort of um, acceptance that I've gained in the U.S., especially in the country market. It's the first sign of acceptability. Yeah, if you can hit Hee Haw, you're home free. That's right. You're well on the way to home free. Hopefully. Uh -huh. They tell me your favorite scent, your favorite perfume is what? <laughs> Come on, you know what it is. Sweat. Sweat. <laughs> of course, sweat. <laughs> Uh -huh. And have you got a <laughs> song yet that's better than this one? Hanky Panky? Yeah. This is the cue. Come on. Oh, you sang that at Expo, though, didn't you? Yes. Go ahead to KD Lang. Howdy, KD. Howdy. I'm an old transplanted Albertan. I'm curious how the act went over in the uh, clubs in New York. Um, they went well, considering. Um, we were. All, uh, all the shows we've done at the bottom line in New York were op for opening. We were opening acts. So um, after the Letterman show, the last time uh, people came to see us generally, so it went it went well. And uh, I think the city slickers are starting to see a little bit of get a little, little uh, a little little bit okay, of okay. there. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd just like to say I saw you a couple of years ago when I was visiting in Calgary, and your band and you just blew me away. Keep the good work up. Thanks very much. Thanks. See, that's another fan. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'd like to uh, just say to Katie Lang that I really enjoy your music and your style, and you can really move to your kind of music. I love your clothes, and don't let Jack give you a hard time. Bye-bye. Oh, Jack. I've never given her a hard time. Jack, in fact, Jack has been the, the light of my Vancouver days. Jack, do you think you could sing that tobacco song for us again? Would you like your guitar? I don't have my guitar, but you can sing without your no, guitar. No, I can't sing without Jack, a guitar. Jack, you said that you were quitting smoking. I think this is a great opportunity, <laughs> a great <laughs> opportunity to sing your Scottish <coughs> tobacco song. I went to the doctor today, and this was supposed to be a secret. Oh. And he said, stop smoking. So today, I've had four cigarettes. Well, that's not bad, but this time I'd normally have had 40 or 50 cigarettes. Oh, I see. I can't sing a tobacco song. You can't even accompany me. Well, I think you could probably sing an a cappella. Can you just give them a couple bars? The people just wait for moments Only like Only if you'll sing it, too. I don't know it. There was an old man, and he had, had a wooden leg. He had no tobacco, no tobacco could he beg. Another old man was as sly as a fox. Don't, don't, don't. He's got tobacco in his old tobacco box. Said the first <laughs> old man, will you give me a chew? Said the second old man, I'm dashed if I do. Save up your money and keep off the rocks and you'll always have tobacco in your old tobacco box. See? No applause from outside. He's we could have played the original on the air if, if, Stu, if, if, we, uh, if Steve had been half awake. Well, I think that that, that, that should tell everyone right what there that you do? quit smoking. I've got ten minutes to fill yet. Great. Do you want to do the Let's program? Let's have some more people phone. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good day, KD. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, this is an old city slicker, welcome you back to Vancouver here. We really enjoy having you around. And I'd like to know if you're playing anywhere else this weekend. I missed you last night. No, we're playing in Seattle this weekend, and but we're playing New Year's Eve at the Commodore. Okay, I guess I'll see you then. Great. Thank you. That's Bye. right. That's the night when I saw you there with the sprung dance floor, isn't it? Quite yep. a place. Used to be. Anyway, go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Webster, I think you do a great job on your singing. And I was just wondering, about a year ago, you mentioned something about uh, uh, starting a fan club. I was wondering if you follow through with that. You mean a Katie Lang fan club? Yeah. No, not really, except that every time <laughs> I put it on the air. This is the annual meeting of the Katie Lang fan, fan club. <laughs> right? And we'll pass a motion. Okay. We'll Thank you. Do something. <laughs> Whatever you do at a meeting. Let's have some callers. There's lots of callers here. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello, Josh. Yeah. And Katie, I think you two should go out on the road as a team. I, th I think so. That sounded good. I think so. I'm not much good at the soft shoe shuffle, shuffle and I can't wear cowboy boots. Uh -huh. My arches are too broken down. Yeah. What I wanted to ask Katie <laughs> is, uh, who are you going to cheer for on Sunday? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm an Edmontonian. You are. But uh, you're from Con I'm Consort. Consort, Consort Alberta. Uh -huh. Th that's a tough question. But uh, let the best team win. Let's put it that way. You going to be watching it? I don't know. I'll be, You're in Seattle. be in Seattle. Go ahead from Kelowna. 
Hi, Katie. I just wanted to say that we're great fans of yours. We really enjoy your performance. The first time we saw you was, or, er, you know, first time we heard you was on Jack's show last year, and we've been following your career since then. Really enjoyed your acceptance speech for the most promising actress. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, wanted to one. ask you about <coughs> David Letterman. Did, we were sorry that we didn't get to see you dialogue with him, but we totally enjoyed your performance. Mm -hmm. What did you think of David Letterman? Oh, David Letterman. Well, um, the show is live television, so it's in and out, very quickly done. I didn't really get to talk to David very much, probably about 30 seconds worth, but it was very exciting. New York was very exciting. Keep up the good work, and uh, Jack, don't quit your day job yet. No, I better not. I won't take to the boards as we used to. Although many Websters have been very prominent performers on the boards. <laughs> you know what the boards are. No, what are the boards? On the boards. On the stage, on the boards. Oh, on the boards. Yeah. Everybody in showbiz knows that. I do. I know now. Go ahead, please. Katie, I think that you're fabulous, and I'd like to see you do an album like Linda Ronstadt, only better, but of all standards. I think you'd be fabulous. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay. Will you hang around until the end of the program? Yep. We'll take phone calls to, to Katie, and we'll take phone calls to me, yeah. or whatsoever is across your little mind tonight, after the break. My guest is the country punk singer. You're not mad at that. Can I call you country punk? Sure, you can. But I came up with a new name. What's a new name? Torch and twang. That's better. Torch and twang. <laughs> <laughs> Torch and twang music from Katie Lang. <laughs> Caller. Oh, just a minute. I'll push the buttons. You do the talking. My throat's sore because you made uh, me sing. Oh. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Hi. Hi, I just like to see your music is great, and uh, I was just wondering, do you have any albums out? Uh, we have one album on the Bumstead label, and it's available in some stores. Very Vancouver? Yeah, it should be. Oh, this okay, Christmas. I'll check it out. That's great. Keep, keep, uh, keep up the good work. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Go ahead, caller. Oh. Katie? Yeah. Yeah, um, I saw your show last night at the um, <laughs> expo thing, and your band is just fantastic. You know, especially like, the guitar player. You just couldn't pay those guys enough, you know? Yeah, I know. They're great. And how about that guitar player? Well, he's pretty good, too. Uh, yeah. Well, I love you. Yeah, well, you don't think you should pay them more, hey? Oh, consider it. Okay, thanks. That, just a minute. That's your guitar player. <laughs> I know. He phoned up. He phoned up. No wonder he phoned. Oh, my goodness that's gracious. A, that's me. a nasty trick. Why, why didn't he come and bring his damn guitar with him? We could have used it tonight. I know. Go ahead, please. Hi, Katie Lang. Hi. Love you, dear. Thank you. I the first at Expo, I saw your show for the first time and fell in love with you and your gang there. Great. Have you heard of Dolly Deluxe? And what do you think of Opera and Rock? Dolly Deluxe? Yes, Dolly Deluxe did a show at Expo uh, probably towards the end of it, and it was a combination of Opera and Rock, and it was in the same theater you were in, the Xerox International uh, Theater. Oh, missed that one. Who was the other one? Wait. Who was the other one you mentioned? This was the Dolly Deluxe group. The Dolly Deluxe. Oh, no, missed that one. Great name, thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, Kathy, I saw you at your last show in Vancouver, and uh, I promised you some cowboy boots. Yeah. Did you ever get them? Uh, I don't think so. Did you send them in the mail? Well, no, actually, I gave them to my cousin, who's your guitar player. That's that guy again. He stole your no, cowboy boots. No, no, boots. no, I'm not his, I'm his cousin. And I gave him to Gordy to give to you. No, so but you Gordy stole your cowboy boots. Gordy, I was yeah. wondering where he got those new boots from. Well, you get a hold of Gordy because he's got the boots. He's probably hanging on to them. I will. <laughs> Thank Gordy. You. Okay, and also don't ever fire him because I don't really know if he can do anything else. Gordy. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay I, bye -bye. I won't fire Okay, him. let's carry on with Torch and Twang. Go ahead, Go ahead. please. Hello? Hello. Um, Hello. I'm wondering, like, if you're, are you going to get settled down soon? Like, uh... Oh yeah. Like with a, uh, like with a family and and what have you, or, or just how normal are you? Sorry. Next caller. Have you got plans for marriage? <laughs> I'm married.
married. I got married on the Junos. Oh. To my music. Oh, to your music. I'm nosy, though. Go ahead, please. What's normal? What's normal? <laughs> You're normal. I'm normal. Everybody's yeah. normal. Go ahead, Lots caller. of people out there aren't, but we are. Caller. Yeah, Katie. Yeah. Do you find uh, that getting promoted in Canada is kind of a problem? No. Uh, Not at all. The reason I'm asking is, do you know Rita McNeil? Yes. Uh, I'd never heard of her until she did a, sh um, a bit on TV and then came to Expo. Uh -huh. It seems like we've got so much good talent, yourself included, that you don't really see enough of. Well, I think it's all a matter of perseverance and pressure and just getting yourself on every newspaper in Canada and just doing all these interviews. This is yeah. my fourth interview today. That's why when, everyone knows who I am. Winning Junos and going on Zowski and having Webster as an old buddy. He'll always give you a plug anyway. Yeah, well, I'm sure glad that you bring Katie on, Jack. She is fantastic and we all love her. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. I'm big for torch and twang. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Call her. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'd like to say that um, me and my mom both like Katie Lang, and we like her music. Great, thank you. How old are you? How old are you? Oh, they're gone. Do not listen. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hey. That's you. Yeah, I hope all this uh, praise doesn't go to your head because you are, uh, you're just uh, fresh air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What about me? I'm kind of old, stale smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Katie. Hi. I think you're great. Um, when is the uh, Hee Haw show going to be aired? Should be aired sometime in January, February, sometime in the new season. That was the one I huh? lied about. I saw you at the Bob Williams bash. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not the first time I saw you. You know, I saw you when you first started. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea if you do some torch songs. You gotta, you know, you've got a voice besides your country voice. Right. And uh, for goodness sake, if they get you down in the States, don't let them civilize you. Oh, <laughs> I, I <laughs> okay? don't think that's possible. <laughs> Thank you. And don't let them civilize you. Don't let them, you. yeah. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Hi. Uh, this is a great grandma with a head cold. Uh, I think you're nuts, and you dare to be nuts and spell nuts backwards, you stun me. And I hope that if the Big Cheese Jamboree and Armstrong invite you up here, you better come because you're, we're kind, you're kind of people and we love you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Go ahead, caller. Something happened This is fun. I, I'm going to get ahead. one of these phones in my house. Go ahead house. from Mackenzie. Where are you? Caller. Did I lose that one? I lost that one. Okay. My mistake. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jack. 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 Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I have a couple of things to say. First, I'd like to say... Uh, uh, Katie, you're doing great. And uh, Jack, I uh, wanted to ask you if uh, you could sing tenor. No. <laughs> tenor, 15 miles from here. No, I never could. <laughs> I never could. I never could sing tenor. <laughs> I suppose that was a socially significant question I was asked. Go ahead, caller. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Katie. Hi. I saw you last New Year's Eve in Edmonton. It was one of the most memorable times I had. I'm glad you're in Vancouver this year, and hopefully it'll stay a tradition. Thank, Thank you. you. Getting thousands of calls. Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi. Katie? Yeah. Hi, this is a fan from Victoria. Hi. I just want to let you know, next time you're here, I'll be here with Bubbles. Great. Okie dokie. Here's one from Kelowna. Yeah, hi, Jack. Hi, Katie. Hi. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, my wife and I had uh, ran into at the Victoria Hello. Ferry, uh, actually on the Sydney side, about a year Hello. and a half ago, uh, a year ago last summer, in fact. And uh, you were with your band, and you would came over and given my wife a flower. Oh, yeah. And uh, I don't know, we just thought you were really neat there. We started following your, your career as we started seeing you on television. And mm -hmm. uh, we just wanted to say hi to you and uh, congratulations on your career. And, and uh, hopefully you'll come up to Kelowna someday. Thank you. And uh, one last thing. I just wanted to say, Jack, uh, I've never gotten on the phone and talked to you. And uh, I think you're a right on guy and keep doing a good job. Maybe get into politics someday. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I was busy there for the moment. <laughs> What's happening here? That's a phone call by Hans that's on my... Thing here. Let me just, where's this? Hi, Victoria. Go ahead, please. Hi, Bubbles. Hello, Katie. How are you doing? Oh, fine, thanks. That's good. I'm uh, from Morinville, Alberta. I'm sure really? you've been around there a few times. Yeah. Um, I saw you at the Winnipeg Folk Festival a few years ago, and I was astounded by your talent. 
Thank you. And uh, I would uh, make sure you promise me a dance at the uh, Commodore on New Year's Eve. I'll try. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, I have something pertinent to mention here. Uh, what? Well, to you and everyone else, what about those fish? What about those fish? What about those fish today that were poisoned? I don't know. What about them? Apparently somebody forced open the door and threw in some copper sulfate and killed them. Well, I... you got to catch them before you can do it. I was them. kind of upset about that, Jack. Oh, so was everybody, I think. You well, know. let's send in money to the uh, aquarium and help those fish $60,000. Next caller. Yeah. Just had to mention that. Oh, yeah. I it shows you you've got a social conscience. <laughs> Go Caller. Ahead, please. Hi there, Katie. Um, just like to know, uh, what was it like working with Dave Edmonds as producer? Uh, it was, it was fine. He gave us a lot of room. Um, he, he, he basically, we basically made a good representation of the band live. So, um, really excited about the album coming out. Good. Go ahead, please. Okay. Hey, Katie. Yeah. This is Gary from Rock and Windsor out here in Van, and you're hot shit and a mind like a steel trap. And hey, Jack. It's not what's on our little... <laughs> I wish they wouldn't do this. I mean, that wasn't a very... It wasn't a very bad rude word, but I don't like people swearing on the program at night. You know, do you? I don't. I'm very square. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Me? Yeah. Oh, hi, Katie. Hi. Congratulations on your career. Thank you. Do you know where Monitor Alberta is? Do I know where Monitor Alberta is? Are you kidding? <laughs> I spent many a summer there. I'm sure that you and I know friends. Oh, I'm sure we do. Okay, keep it up. Okay. Thank you very much. From Victoria. Hello. Hi. Yes. Katie. Yes. I'm from Consort. No, you're not. Yes, I am. And I just want to say how very proud I am every time you mention Consort. It is the most delicious little town. Oh, Consort. And I'm sure that I have relations who taught you in school, and I just love it when you say you're from Consort. Well, what's your name? Uh, my name? Yeah. Well, uh, would McFetridge ring a bell? You bet. My my very first music teacher was McFetridge. Yes, yes, indeed. That's not you, well, is it? I saw your con... Is that you? You weren't my teacher. You bet. Hilda. You're Hilda? You bet. I'm her sister-in-law. Oh, well, say hi to Hilda for me. Yes. Still oh, I want to say that... Hold on. After the break. Oh, sorry. Golf medicine. <coughs> Kitty Lang, thanks. Tomorrow, old clothes and porridge. Art Cubie, trouble ahead. On Webster, at 5 p.m. precisely. Stay tuned for Tony. <laughs>